exactly the most important historic continue, excuse me, this interruption here, but they have, have like that site is being, um, because of those events, probably the most important historical site on the West Coast of North America. Here's an area uh, map made for the Granny Garden book. The point of land in the lower left has been Peninsula, that, that's Esteban Point Lighthouse. In the lower right is Hot Springs Cove. And just north of there, you'll see an inlet, the Stewards and Camp. Now that's a lot, was a logging camp and there was a road that went through the garden. Now without that road, the scale of developments post Granny could never have been the same. This aerial view above, uh, from the mountain above the garden shows you the lower left Ray Lake. The property goes back to there. You can see the garden clearing just in front of that. And then through Hesquit Harbor, the far point is Hesquit Village, the traditional village of the Hesquit people. This is an aerial view of the garden. Uh, you can see the relationship of the garden, the beach and the lake. It's about 110 meters back from the beach. Now here she is as a young girl. She's working with her father in the Boer War. He was a quasi doctor, not quite an official one. You can see the smirk on her face, which I saw many times years later. Like, and here she is a, as a young woman or an older woman, I guess, and um, no, older young woman. Anyway, she, she told me she was uh, Timothy e Eaton's personal secretary in Winnipeg. You might have to put the inquiry sign up on that one. But um, 1909, she got married to William Francis John Ray Arthur. There he is, Willie. Now, Willie was uh, Scott and he was a remittance man. He was paid to keep out of Scotland. Now, they were, <laughs> they were in Vancouver for the next five and a half years or so. And during that time, Ada um, uh, bore three children. But Willie, towards the end, got into alcohol and opium. And so they were looking for a way out of the problem. And this chap's father solved it for them. This is Gordon Gibson. Like he became, he was a lumber baron, founded Tassus Company, and a very popular MLA. Now he was homesteading with his family, his father, mother, and siblings about 400 meters uh, away from uh, the garden site. That's Gordon Gibson. And, and this is uh, uh, before uh, the... Uh, oh, yeah. And, oh, uh, everyone should turn their microphone off. And they, yeah, yeah. Turn it off. It's, it's just very disturbing. Anyway, uh, uh, the, um, so he, um, his father went to Scotland to discuss some lumber interests and he met the Lord Prevost of uh, Glasgow, who, who happened to already know about Willie's plight because he was in touch with the previous Lord Prevost, who was Willie's father. So Gibson recommended to uh, the Ray Arthurs, you might say, that they sent the family up to Boat Basin, that there was a spot behind their homestead, upland spot, that would probably create a great garden. And if they were successful in doing it, it met the requirements of the government, under the Homesteading Act, they were they would be deeded 120 acres, and so the the uh, Ray Arthurs were impressed, and they commissioned the Gibsons to build a cabin in the future site of the garden and a trail from the, uh, the beach to the garden. Now, this vessel, the Princess McQuinna, a CPR freighter and uh, passenger boat, plied this waters of the west coast from Victoria to Cape Scott about every 10 days. And it was in April two, uh, 1915 that two Granny and Willie and their three children would have offloaded out of those side cargo doors down a ladder into a rope ladder into um, a dugout canoe that they had purchased from a Hesquit family. And they would row the six miles across the harbor into a new life. Here's the view, almost a hundred years on since their landing to the day of where they landed at Boat Basin. And you're looking, the far point on the right is Hesquit Village where the McQuinna would have anchored off. Now this is the remains of the canoe. It's just the shard of the prow of the canoe. 
but people that visit Boat Basin get to see that. It's on the original trail that the Gibsons built for the Ray Arthur family. This is the log cabin they built. That's Willie sort of leaning against the post there, nonchalant as he normally was. And that's probably daughter Margaret in the door. Now they realized early on that they couldn't lug their uh, gear, goods and stuff up and down the forest pathway. So they built this expressway, this elevated causeway, split cedar all the way from the beach to the garden. And here you'll see it as it passes over a gully, gully on route. Now you'll see it at near the end. This was taken early, early spring this year. But here she is, the iconic uh, photo of Auntie Annie. Now, she bore eight more children during the formative years of the garden when the stumps, the hard work, the stumps were being pulled and all the hard labor. So she was pregnant during most of that time. Now, five of those children uh, survived in infancy. She became an expert shot. She trapped cougars and, and she lured, go used goats to lure the cougars in. It was quite a, 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 nice, a good bounty, $20 for the left ear and she became known as Cougar Annie. Now this house they built in two, uh, 1921, um, inside the front porch was a small store and boat basin store and post office. Now the boat basin post office was probably Ada, Ada Annie's uh, greatest scheme because it brought a monthly stipend for the postmistress, but more importantly, no longer did she have the arduous uh, rowing to get across to Hesquit, the government would pay somebody to do that for them. But she got the uh, post office somewhat illegally. She forged a petition. A lot of these signatures are in the same handwriting. And then when the government found out in 1968 that she had reached 80, which is far past the required retirement age, they asked her to retire, but she you know, Lally appointed her son, Thomas, Tommy, to as the postmaster. And here he is in 1972, bringing in a couple of sacks of mail. There was twice a week delivery from Tofino. And there was no ma actual mail in there. It was all post office circulars. Here's Ada Annie um, coming out of Tommy's cabin with the actual mail from that day. And but Tommy couldn't do any arithmetic, you might say, for the monthly account. And Ada Annie was going blind. So guess who got co-opted into doing the monthly account? Well, the object, of course, was to make the post office look busy. Now, that wasn't a simple matter. But I was going up there almost monthly for 15 years. And, and I um, would stop at Parksville, at Bucker Fields, pick up some green. For, uh, some oats for the goats and, and laying mash for the chickens. And I got them to accept um, stamps uh, in, in lieu of payment. And I also got a ton of my friends to buy their annual stamps there. I would give them a business envelope and they would self address it back, tuck in maybe 50 bucks. Next time up at Boat Basin, I would exchange it for first edition stamps that I would pre order and, and, um, and here's a couple of set types of them. And this, this one here is Captain Cook. So that would have been 1778, the bicentennial. And Tommy, the postmaster, I get him to hit it a bunch of times with the postmark. That's 1979. The post office off also gave uh, the opportunity for Ida Annie to expand her um, mail, mail order nursery business, but you can see she almost gave away her product because she knew that with the sale, there would be postage and that would help guarantee that the monthly stipend existed. Now in 19, uh, whatever it was, uh, 70, 81, I guess, I, 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 I took a bunch of dahlias down to tubers down to Vancouver stored them over the winter. And in the spring, I trimmed them, got some uh, Ziploc bags, stuck, keyhole punched them so they could breathe, tucked in uh, vermiculite and the dahlias, slapped on this label, 
and flogged them at the Granville market, which created about a thousand dollars income for Ada Annie. Now she also uh, uh, used the free to uh, use uh, tried to sell eggs to Tofino. She had uh, just a thirty or forty chickens. Here she is going to the coop. In the background there, that's her son Frank, her second eldest son, and, and he. He lived in Tofino, but he was the lineman that repaired the magneto single copper wire line that ran from a house at the Estevan and onto Tofino underwater by cable. But um, he would go back and forth to Tofino and he would take eggs down to Tofino restaurants. And, and that didn't last too long though, because it, she, it, she just couldn't resist unloading the older eggs first and a lot of the eggs showed up with fetuses inside. <laughs> and so they didn't order anymore. But the lady in, in that picture, Karen Thorndate, she was just helping, she's from Seattle, just helping out in Annie on the, during the summer. She became the first woman to sail uh, around the three, uh, first American woman to sail around the three great capes. Now here are the rain barrels, um, the somewhat better condition when she was there, but this was their water supply, catching water off the roof, a cedar roof. It's amazing it didn't do anyone in, but, but it really got done in by water because in 1936, he was out fishing in a canoe and he drowned. And um, that was 25 years after they landed. And by that time, there was only three of the children left at Boat Basin. So Ada realized that she needed to have a husband. So she advertised in the Prairie uh, Papers, Western Producer, Winnipeg Free Press, those type of things. Object ma matrimony, but the spiel she put in there uh, lured, the, lured the guys in, have 120 acres, large garden and orchard, post office and store. So everyone thought it was a metropolis or something. So the guys, they came in, but she had to do that three more times because the husbands kept dying off. And uh, so he had four husbands by the time it was all done. Now I showed up Easter Sunday, 1968, stayed as on a prospecting visit and stayed in this prospecting cabin in Ray Basin, not too far from the garden. I met Ada Annie. It was just like something out of the Ozarks. There was no uh, modern conveniences, just all funk and, and lots of widgets and what have you. And here was a woman that needed some assistance. It was great prospecting in the area. The, I had a place to stay, incredible natural history and of course recreational opportunities. And I made it my life's ambition to focus on this area and try to get back once a month uh, to help it Annie and to fool around a bit and prospect. And I managed to bat about 70% over the next 15 years. Here's a view from the one room prospector cabin that looks out through Ray Basin, which was the first proposed ecological reserve in British Columbia. And around the corner about, you're looking into Hesquit Harbor, around the corner there in the boat base uh, is, but a kilometer is where the beachhead for Boat Basin is. Now I, I moved, uh, for a couple of years I kept back, coming back regularly. Oh uh, no, sir, let me first mention that in 1981, um, Ada Annie, after a, year, a relentless campaign, coerced me into purchasing the property. I doubled the price the loggers were asking because I thought it was way too low. And um, and I brought in two caregivers and and uh, gave her a life estate. In 1983, she was whisked away against her will by family members. And in 1985, she passed away in Alberta General Hospital, days short of her 97th birthday. Now this shot, I moved to Bo Basin for a couple of years. I kept going back and forth uh, regularly, but. 1987, I moved there, stayed in this cabin that Frank built in the garden. Now this particular shot is one of the early world croquis championships. Friends from Vancouver that, run, that ran concurrent with the world title hockey championships. There's been 50 of those. 
but that's for another time. Here's the uh, garden cabin now. You can see the uh, front porch is engulfed within the cabin. There's now skylights and yellow cedar counters. There's running water, two bedrooms. Now, summer students, if they're there to help out, will stay there as will volunteers. It's just a great cabin now. 1988, I built my cabin or my house uh, by the beach. And you can see there's a bit of a, it's on a, 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 a top of a, a gravel beach that was uplifted after the uh, glaciers receded. So that comes in later. So and when I decided at that point, I give, tried to have restore a couple trails within the garden. It was totally, it was totally overrun with broom and, and blackberry, everything you think conifers, you couldn't really figure it out. And um, I had no intention to do the whole thing, but it was soon, we, soon apparent that the extent and diversity of her plantings underneath this jungle that had engulfed it was far beyond anyone's expect, expectations. And I knew that there was a heritage garden there that needed to be restored, that I was the only person in position to restore it, and that if I didn't go for it, I'd wonder why I didn't every day thereafter. So Chainsaw Madness started. The process was uh, uh, to try to knock out the indigenous stuff and leave what wasn't indigenous and, um, and just proceed onwards. And by 19... 98, the book, this was what, what had been accomplished by then. And at that point, it was a mesmerizing maze of two kilometers of moss covered pathways. Um, since then, I've di uh, dissected uh, a fair amount of those larger green areas. <clears throat> so here's an aerial view of the garden that shows one of the attributes, quite obviously. It's surrounded by large conifers. And that creates a heat trap on the garden. Now, the soil is sandy loam and down about a foot, foot and a half is this impervious clay layer upon which the water table wicks. And through capillary action, the plants never need to be watered. And there's a slight uh, bias, to, a slope bias to the sea Either any family would just ditch it and off would run surplus water and it works till this day. Plus, of course, it's in the best gardening zone in the world, temperate, temperate zone, much like an English garden. And another attribute was Ada Annie planted with a liberal hand, probably to test plants, maybe for her uh, mail order business. But they're all original species, they're unhybridized, and that's, of course, what gardeners really prefer these days, the delicate varieties. This is a uh, English primrose. Is it, uh, and this shows you the fertility of plants as well. This, this is a, a rogue rogo, rodo, you might say. It's volunteered outside the fence, probably take, the seeds taken by birds. A view from the eastern fence line, you'll see some of the ditching there. You get incredible moods in this garden. The weather's changing. The low light, the spring and the fall is unbelievable. You'll see greens right across the green spectrum. Here's earlier this spring. You know, daffodils are really prolific there. There's probably 30 different species. They volunteer everywhere. And again, you get that low light mood in the spring. This is a, what I call a long view. That's probably 150 yards going through there. Again, a ditch in the foreground. This is a cat can of a uh, hazelnut. You know, she brought in hazelnuts for the protein and they like to volunteer around the place. Azaleas along the back fence line, accentuated against the conifers that had grown up against the fence line. Uh, it's just a wonderful soft feeling. And you get another layer of conifers behind it, which gives you another, another uh, dimension of the garden. You never see a geographic uh, form. Um, here's daylilies. Now that's another 
um, a, a plant that's withstood the test of time. There's probably about 30 varieties there that daylily fanatics would die for, be, doubles, triples, whatever. They live in the ditches, which are, is immune from being choked out by sphagnum moss. Here's, um, this is a full snow lit valley, which will occupy places if they're not mowed. There's irises. This is the only thing I've introduced to the garden. These are American cranberry. Now you can see since I planted that, there's a sphagnum moss hummock has formed underneath it. There's a bear in a pear tree. That picture made the cut for the book, Cucurani's Garden. Now the pear tree that the bear was in is the one on the left. Now once the fence went down, the bears came in, they ravaged all the fruit trees and uh, because they eat the fruit before it's ripe. You don't, the good guys don't get any or didn't, now there's none. Monet's walk, that's a heather, all sorts of heather, probably introduced is relative willy. A lot of the pathways are mowed heather, nice firm like a carpet and require little maintenance. That's uh, Leona on the way down, plus uh, giant red mount in the background. The tree on the left there is a lyrodendron tree, tulip tree. Botanists say that that's one of the largest in this zone that they've seen. Another thing that's way beyond uh, size from the native country is this Berberus darwinii. The botanists really like that action. Snowballs. Croci. This is looking for a hazelnut tree through to the uh, southern fence line. Now you'll see the original growth, uh, old growth forest in behind. That's another layer that gives you a background to all the scenes in the garden. Again, hence enhancing it, very soft. And now the layering in the spring, all these views, um, it's phenomenal, the, the mood changes. Here, uh, the darker areas, that's rhododendrons. It's called Roto Row, you pass under it. Was taken earlier this year looking towards your house. These are wooden enemies along the back fence line. This is a gate to nowhere now, like azaleas over it. And in the background on the left is Anchianthus. Now, this zone was the last major area I cleared. This is about three or four years ago, I and mean, nothing is need, needs to be done now. I this had salal bushes about three foot high on it and, and uh, huckleberries. And I got the, the mower, the gas push mowers, jammed on the governor to full throttle. And it became a, just a hell on wheels and it ate everything up inch by inch. Didn't have to rake anything up, it just mulched it. But when I got to the uh, southern, southern fence line, the darker area there, I saw all these enclaves into the forest that with not too much work could be opened up and appear like small theaters and, and enhance the, the area of the garden immensely by giving it depth and something new. So this is the yin and the yang, the light and the dark. Here's a view from inside one of those enclaves looking back to my greenhouse for years, which I'll mention later. And here's the full panel of the uh, theater row, all the different theater, darkened theater stages. Now this is a garden most people miss when they walk through because they're looking the other way. They don't see the entrance to it. It's a secret garden. It was made, it's called Cupid's Garden. It was made basically to offset some of the hardships the children suffered in their early days. It's surrounded by a Solel hedging. It's, a, it's in the shape of a heart. Here's, here's the love seat. There's, those are flat green. Uh, shakes, and they're, they're very flexible. So when you lean on them, they're spring loaded. Here's looking into the garden. The one place you can do that at the love seat. This is the boat basin maintenance department, you might say. You have to have all lots of uh, mowers at the ready because boat basin, uh, people drop by and ask if they can help sort of thing. But, and also Boat Basin is the terminus of the Hesquit uh, Peninsula Trail, which is one of the best trails in the entire West Coast. 
and maybe only a hundred do it compared to 6,000 on the West Coast Trail, what have you, and it's so much better. But they come by and you have to have mowers ready if they ask to volunteer. Now this is a, the boat base and brush cutter that we use for a higher brush. No, actually it's the Atlo Air helicopter earlier this year landing in the clearing before theater, theater row. It's dropping off people from the Central West Coast Forest Society that were staying at the Field Study Center uh, while they were uh, under a restoration project to, to, to uh, correct a slide that landslide that came off of a, uh, a, a logging show. Lots of wild animals in the bar, of course the bears pass through cougars, but you don't see cougars. I've only seen cougars uh, three times in, in my life, uh, head on. And uh, when you hear them in the bush and you can... So here is uh, Kuranny's arsenal for trapping bears and cougars, some of it. Now this chap on the right, that was her third husband. She is the one that she is, uh, she is rumored to have shot. Here's the entrance to the garden at, at 72. Now you'll see the orchard, like the canopy of the orchard in the background. Uh, Tommy's uh, son's garden, vegetable garden on the right. Now here was we uh, spiffing up the garden, restoring it, but the entrance way was rather blase. It needed something more dramatic. So the pergola started. The boat basin saw mill, mill, mill 26 foot boards and the boardwalk is four feet wide at the road and every board tapers. So at the far end, it's only two feet wide and the pergola tapers as well. It goes from 10 feet in height to eight feet. Of course, it focuses on the door of Annie's house. So it looks much longer than it actually is. This is Brian E. Penn's sketch that gives you the perspective. Now off to the right of the pergola, this what you was seen in 72, Tommy's garden. This is what it looks now like now. It's the memorial garden. You'll see in the upper left a statue as a woman doing handstands. And basically that's the memorial garden. The statue on the right is that, that of a whale, supposedly. Here's the memorial statue. And here's where it came from. It was affixed to the tree that it grew on, the tree submerged. So I had to wait for the lake level to go down about four feet in the summer, strap on an outrigger on the canoe so I could stand up and with a 36 inch chainsaw, cut off uh, below uh, the water because of course you wanted to have that loop in the bottom. And it was helicoptered down to the garden with this, the whale statue, which can be made to, to spout on command. And in front of the whale, uh, a blue wheat was planted. So when late in the summer, when there was breezes coming, there'd be a wave action in the wheat and it'd make the whale look like it was swimming. So this is the Japanese garden. This is on the door to enter the garden. This is the Japanese garden, it's a sushi bar. It's one piece of yellow cedar, 25 feet long. It tapers and that's the natural taper of the tree. You can see it focuses through two Shinto gates into the depths of the forest beyond. Now here's the sushi bar in the making. That's the mobile dimension boat basin sawmill. What you do is you mill the log down through the center. You take away the mill, you flip the log and then you mill down again and you have two parallel sides and a long slab. Now, contiguous to the um, Japanese garden is the Japanese forest. And this, came, this arose 18 years after the Japanese garden. So some say it was great foresight. In this area, there was maybe three times the number of small trees. Um, and, with, and they all had branches right down to the ground. You couldn't, it was impenetrable. You couldn't see any of this. And I knew what was going on there. That's why I cleared it out. And Cougar Annie had cleared this area um, before she realized that the soil is too deep there for a capillary action to meet, to reach the surface plants. So, but the trees could go down to the clay layer 
uh, but they didn't, there's no nutrients in decaying matter. And that, that's all they had to eat. So they, these are hundred year old hemlock trees, basically a hardwood. So we call it the Japanese forest because near, in urban areas near in Japan, if there's a forest, people will go out there and sweep the garden uh, floor and trim the lower branches. And that's what it looks like. Now here you can see the transition between the lower soil and the uh, higher soil. Near the, uh, near the house, I built this early on. This is a Eagle Woods shed. It's 50 feet wingtip to wingtip, split cedar shakes, lapped, and um, it sits on a milled two inch uh, thick uh, red cedar floor. Now, because of the compound roof it's falling in two directions, I had to build a model to determine some of the size of the posts, the height of the post. Here's the woodshed going up. This would have been about 1989. Anyway, this is the uh, head of the woodshed. And a few years ago, there's some major slides coming off the old logging shows and they brought down a lot of fur to the beach, which under the theory, if you don't use it, you lose it. If I had to buck up the wood and I had to build this new woodshed out of split cedar. So that can hold three cords of wood. It's eight feet, nine feet tall on the right. And near the back of the garden, when the uh, it came time to take stuff out of Annie's house because it was collapsing, we built Annie's museum. And here it is. The actual original building was built in 1981. You can see in the lower center, that's a 10 inch pipe coming in and a generator, there's a turbine there. And the object was to make power for Cougar Annie. That would have made 5,000 watts of power, uh, which is enough for heat, but it would have required 1.2 million gallons a day shooting down that pipe, a siphon out of Ray Lake. Now that never happened because they took Cougar Annie away, but you can see a hemlock fell through the roof eventually. Um, but when it came time to uh, save the stuff in the house, just posting up off the uh, floor and eight foot shakes and he had a dry building again. And this, and so now you can see the post office counter and store counter, lots of post office stuff in there. You can't see sort of half of the stuff, but you can see in the lower left, the tip of her bed, she was just over five feet, her rocking chair, the original front gate, and there's of course leg hole traps, all sorts of things in there. Now, but power did show up at Bow Basin Beach, not to that scale. It's a three inch line that delivers uh, 120 uh, watts of power and puts the house under pressure. And that's enough power because it goes in the batteries, which you can store. Built this greenhouse in the garden. Those are sliding windows. I purchased a Demex. Now it's very civilized gardening. It's waist high gardening, five foot beds, and they can get away with five feet because you can weed through the sliding windows. And here's the uh, sign carved on yew wood, the entrance way. That's one of the earlier gardens. And as you can see, you can have a salad every day of the year. And that did well for quite a long time until you see where, where the vegetables are grown now. And dahlias, now the caretake, caregivers we're supposed to dig up the dahlias, but one year they didn't and they all got wiped out. But this last January, a, a lady from Euclid, knowing that this was a hand-me-down from, from Ada Annie and that we would like to have one return, that cactus um, dahlia on the right grew this summer that was picked about three weeks ago. And this is where they'll be grown uh, next year. This is a series of about seven raised beds, 25 feet long by five feet, watered automatically by water from Ray Lake under pressure. Anyway, it's just a perfect place to grow stuff. And uh, yeah, so, so this is an interesting sidebar because this is a historical note. This is down by the beach. You can see the house is on this, uh, in top of this embankment, which is an ancient beach uplifted after the glaciers receded, but there's a, a cut in the beach uh, through the embankment that leads directly to the Ray Arthur Causeway, 
and it also leads directly to this winch. So I always thought that the cut was made by uh, the Ray Arthur family, but but no. As I got through the hem, uh, the alders that grew in this area and the driftwood, I finally saw the embankment, and that arrow on the left points to a, a tree that grew after the cut was made, and the other arrow on the right goes to the up the trail and to the winch and whatever. But this cut was made by Hesquit people uh, maybe four or 500 years ago to pull up their canoes out of harm's way from winter storms. You'll see there's a pergola there. It's got a, um, a um, hammock in it. This is some of the stuff we grew this summer there. Another one of those uh, love seats in the back. Here's a uh, if you're going the other way, you're a little far point in the distance, is that's Hesquit. Now I pondered for several years how, how you could preserve this stuff. And I'm, I thought of setting up a foundation and donating a property to it, but that just doesn't do anything. What is needed was a place where people could come enjoy uh, and appreciate the special cultural and natural history of the area and perhaps become donors. But you couldn't build on the flats down in the forest. It's just too uh damp must and mildew would get you but you could build on the ridge between the garden and the lake i went up there in 81 i saw there was some peekaboo views but the problem was getting to get a road up it would just be too expensive but good fortune came our way the government of bc there was major slides happening and all these steep uh, clear cuts roads uh were climbing the slope and water would accumulate in the upland, uphill ditch and go down and pick on a creek and which couldn't handle the amount of water and, and slides would occur. So they decided to try to backfill these uh, ditches or the roads to the original shape and think that that would stop it. So the contractors were required to stay uh, at logging camps or what have you, private land. But I told, told Dennis of consider it done contracting just the name alone tells you what type of guy he was. I said, Dennis, you'll save 800 bucks a day from what Interfor will charge you if you stay at the logging camp. And not only that, you'll be 18 kilometers closer to your work site. And he, he went for it. He set up shop behind uh, the garden with his several trailers and crew and a uh, year and a half there. And in turn, he built the service road around the garden and tried to get the road to the top. Now here he is digging um, in the area where the raised beds are now. I knew by that time that if you broke through the clay layer, um, you, you entered an, uh, an alluvial deposit, a perfect road making material. So that's where the material came from. And here they are going up the hill. This would be 1998 or something like that. <clears throat> But he got up. So the boat basin foundation was formed and I donated the property. I started to donate it into it. And, and the boat basin sawmill had to get working hard now. We milled up logs, went a lot of windfall logs, beach logs, other logs. And then, but we also had the advantage that the, the, when they were heli logging, every hundred hours or so, they have to change engines. And they have to do a couple of test lifts. And for us, they lifted, uh, they used that time to lift a couple of logs into the, uh, the lumber sort that consider it done, uh, uh, the log uh, sawmill site that consider it done built for us. And there it is lowering a 29,000 pound log into the site. I mean, these are all old growth, big cedars. It's perfectly clear lumber that comes out, perfectly dimensioned. But we also had access through the logging road system to all these chunkies you left behind. And Hesquit is known for, for the straight cedar and, and uh, a lot of split cedar stuff. You'll see the siding on Central Hall at the front, 14 foot splits. Here's now you'll see Central Hall, the field study center on the top left. It's on the ridge there overlooking the garden. Here's a closer a view of the building and cabins five and six, Ray Lake and behind. Here's Central Hall being constructed. Uh, those rafters are four by tens by 26 feet. 
Oh, clear red cedar. Now the building designed around another 25 foot yellow cedar one piece table. And you can see that there's a lot of side tables people can sit on. You can probably see 35 people in here. It has a large fully equipped kitchen, big island, lots of counter space and a solar refrigerator. People line up along that slab in, in the front there to pick up their meals. Here's a picture from the deck uh, a couple of years ago. It's sort of a Where's Waldo view. <laughs> this is from the deck looking the other way, not the deck, from inside through a window looking the other way. Um, that was this summer. Uh, one of the ladies of 10 that stayed there for five nights and had time of their life. Now there's seven cabins of Boat Basin. They're all designed specifically to their site. Uh, uh, this is cabin six. They're all, they're all insulated, have wood heat, and, and all have at least one double bed and two single sleeping benches. This is taken from the double bed of cabin six. This is the cook's quarters within Central Hall. That spiral staircase leads up to a double bed loft. This is cabin five with three double beds and a single bed. Cabin four on the approach. Cabin four, a picture taken from the double bed looking out through the harbor. Cabin three is on a knoll, view from the double bed. Cabin two, the spiral st staircase look up to an isolated second floor where there's a double bed. Cabin one, it has a view of both the lake and the ocean. There's a view of the interior there, looking again down to the one of the sleeping benches. Now every cabin has its own dedicated outhouse, all with a high drop zone, all with a view. And nearby to uh, this whole complex is uh, at, at Ray Lake is swimming dock and the canoe dock, and the water gets over 70 degrees in the summer. And you see the left arrow on the left, that's where the docks are. The arrow on the right is pointing sort of downwards to the garden. The field study center would be along the ridge, but a bit out of the picture. Here's a one, one building of uh, what we call the educational center. There's two buildings. This is the seminar room. It's actually built over the lake. Um, and that's a swivel chair in the middle. So the speaker can be grilled. There's absolutely wonderful echoes in the in the in the lake here's the entrance to the other building this the lesson center do you say or to seed means learn or leave and you'll see it's sort of like an english mental school amphitheater there's five rows of split seater seats that's the western view it's a three-faceted view and that's sort of a distorted panorama and here's the uh what 25 um teenagers that are in from the Sea and Life Training Society uh, boats just on a day visit. And they haven't been around for the last two years, of course, but um, this is a time they all sit in there and they get the lecture about their time about to graduate, they better smarten up. There's a lot of competition and all that sort of stuff. But I think they see that either Annie and what's happened that here, if you work hard, things can happen. Here's uh, one of their dories on the beach. That's the Pacific Grace anchored out. Now to connect the uh, field study center uh, with the garden and other areas, there's 700 meters of split cedar boardwalk, uh, three foot wide in most places. You don't have to look at your feet when you're walking. Inch and a quarter shakes, inch and a half, some of them. Lots of incredible views. It just doesn't go from A to B. It winds around various features. This is where the boardwalk was joined from the north and the south, sort of like the last spike at Craig Lachey. Margaret Horseman's daughter, Emma, drove the last spike. And I mentioned this book, The Lost Gardens of Heligan, because Heligan, this garden was an 18th century garden in Cornwall that was overrun. And they started to restore this exactly the same time I started. I actually met Tim Schmidt. But that book went on to be the best-selling book in Britain for two straight years. 
but it was a BBC documentary on the garden that broke it wide open. The garden gets one and a half million visitors a year. Nearby, Tim Schmidt went on to develop the Eden Project, which gets like 15 million visitors a year. But, so, but I'm pleased to say that there's a large documentary, international documentary company, having a look at Good Granny's garden. They're quite enthralled by the looks of it because it's really, such, it's really an oasis a win within the real garden. This is the natural history around it. And we'll see what happens there. Here's Cougar Annie's garden. This book was, it was issued in 1998. And in 1999, Margaret won the Roger K. Brown Award at the BC Book Prizes for the best book about BC. It went on to sell 21,000 copies. It's been out of print for 12 years and never had any real marketing. And, but in the research leading up to the book, this is a bit of a sidebar, but um, we went into the house for the first time in 12 years and, and opened up the post office drawer. And there was a bunch of <laughs> orders for uh, bulbs and things with the money orders still in there, un unfilled orders. So I wrote Mrs. Uh, Dara in Atacoke in Ontario, this rather, I think, humorous letter explaining the reasons why we're being a little late, 15 years in delivery sort of thing. And, uh, but you can read that on our Instagram account. Oh, I don't think you can today. I think they're, the whole system shut down. But anyway, um, it's an interesting saga. Now, to enhance sales or just get word out about the book, I built this collapsible booth in, that's in the workshop at Boat Basin. And it was for the Circle Craft present uh, Fair at Canada Place and for the BC Home and Garden Show at BC Place. Here we are at the BC Home and Garden Show. Uh, that's Margaret and myself. And it won this award, the best use of small place. And here's where the award is today. It's in the best small booth you could have at Boat Basin. It's the freeholder and services cabins down by the beach. This is a map of the uh, facility. You can see the road, the logging road slashing through, the road around the garden, the road up to the top, the boardwalk system going to the lake and down to the garden. And on the middle left, you'll see a boardwalk that goes through coastal bog habitat. And that leads across the logging road to the Walk of the Ancients, which is a forest pathway through a grove of immense red cedar trees for which there's an interp interpretive pamphlet I made explaining early use uh, by the uh, Heskett people of cedar. You can see lots of places where they've split boards off and what have you. Now, I, you, you're, in the mid, mid, you're in the midst of the densest part of the densest rainforest on earth. And uh, no better example do, do visitors see than in the first five minutes of walking from the beach to the garden, they pass this 1200 year old cedar tree that according to the chief botanist in British Columbia, he's passed on, but it would be in the top 10 if it was ever measured. Now along the Walk of the Ancients, there's five or six of these type of trees. And um, it's just spectacular natural history. It just doesn't get any better than this. So we hope that you'll visit. There's day trips and group visits offered. Now the east side of Vancouver Island residents are just perfectly located to visit. It's actually less time to go there than to Fino. It's longer, but you're on the island highway, better roads, less tedious drive. And, um, um, but you can come in through Tofino as well. All groups are considered a charitable activity for which a parcel tax receipt is issued. So um, we do hope you visit and uh, you probably should visit soon, or at least before there's a 1.5 degree rise in temperature because that's when global warming is a disaster. But on the other hand, this is probably what the beach will look like then. And maybe it's not that bad. But anyway, let's not forget why we're all here. It's an incredible heritage. It deserves to be protected. And here, here's the woman that did it all. And um, anything you can do to help would be great. Just if you like this show, just mentioning it to other groups like Provost Clubs, whatever. But people could form 
part of groups to visit and because it, it can handle like, well, there's seven cabins, like seven couples, no problem at all. Lots of area in the cooking, what have you, and certainly no COVID problems. You don't see anyone else other than me, maybe, maybe a summer student. But uh, anyway, I do hope you help out. And, and of course, we take volunteers now and again. And if you know of any young couple that might be interested in working next summer under Canada Summer Jobs, obviously it won't be too high paying, but uh, it would be the life experience. We'd like to hear from them too. So I mentioned this uh, in final thing that if you want to keep in touch with the garden, uh, this image, Instagram site, um, I've stopped posting over the last month, but I'm going to start up in, within a week or so again. And uh, the whole purpose of the, uh, the site is to put down stories. You're allowed 2,200 characters per posting, but I've got 300 slides I've uh, scanned. And just to put down the funky things over the last 53 years that I can recall, but of course, there's all sorts of natural history, current stuff going on. And uh, so, yeah, that's all you can keep in touch. Well, that's it, I guess. Thank you for this opportunity. It's the uh, first time I've done this. Uh, hope you liked it. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So what do I do now? Thank you. Thank you. Ex exit show. <laughs> no, wait. Okay. Do you see me? Do you see anything else? Hello? Oh, you're on my, you're on mute. Uh, I'm not, I don't think. No, I, you're not, no. I'm muted. I don't hear anyone. Anyway, I hear you. Yeah, okay. So um, do I do anything? I stop the screen sharing or something? I don't know what no, to do. Uh, you stop the screen sharing, Peter. And then uh, you didn't hear it, but there's a big round of applause from everybody in the room. And <laughs> I've, uh, I've got a little camera set up to... Uh, to show uh, to show the room, and then uh, if people in the room want to ask questions, we can just repeat them up here so you can hear them. Are there any questions in the room? I've got a question. Well, what's the answer? <laughs> what's the question? Is there a question? So she says, "Thank you very much for preserving well, all of that." And yeah. she's wondering if the marvelous trees are have any sort of protected status. Well, so yeah, they, they're in a provincial park at the moment. The, the foreshore is, after I moved there, was declared a provincial park, Hesquit Peninsula Park. Hmm. So does that answer your question? Yes, she says, thank you very much. Are there any other questions in the room? I've got another question. Thank you so much for the presentation. Does anybody live there year round now? Well, I'm there 90% of the year. Just, so just no, I mean, somebody, somebody, has, somebody has to do the work. Like uh, right now, the most of the work happens actually over in the fall through the spring when you have to clear back the growth of uh, the year and prepare it all. But no longer do I have to open things up anymore. So it's a lot less work, but still you have to keep going back and I don't mind it too much. But in the winter, of course, um, you have to wait for a high pressure system to show up to make the move. So you're not there quite as much. Although in the early days I was because I could come in through that sheltered waters to the logging camp. I had a boat in those days and you truck up from there. But yeah, no, it's a, uh, no, if you didn't have somebody there all the time, uh, you'd probably lose control of it. Yeah. Was it just you by yourself or are there other folks with you? No, I'm by myself most of the time. I was there for 13 straight weeks when COVID first hit. Wow. But people, uh, I had some friends in Tofino that came up with boat. They got permission to come up and, uh, from the Hesquit people to deliver supplies. They'd hang out for a few days, but yeah, it actually wasn't that bad because I was thinking how worse it was to be in a, a city, like just mm -hmm. confined and all this stuff. So it was pretty quite a privilege, actually, in a way, uh, perverse way, maybe. But the uh, um, no, I don't mind it. But um, 
yeah, and of course I have a partner who comes up once in a while, but she has a involvement with eight or nine community gardens in Vancouver here. And uh, during that season, it's pretty well AWOL, she's all AWOL. Uh, but anyway, it all works. And uh, yeah, so now is the tough time of the year, but uh, hopefully there'll be another spring. <laughs> Robin, you had a question? So Robin's asking, how do you find out when the cabins are available and when you're accepting people? Well, it's virtually all the time, but um, uh, there is hardly any use of the cabins, but I think it will step up because they're going to start doing this type of thing more. It's absolutely a phenomenal place for a group to visit, your family reunion, whatever, or you know, just members of clubs and stuff. But it really is a special place. And I think people will find the prices is, is less than going to Tofino and places like that. And much the experience is pretty well unbelievable. And and um, there's well, yeah. Peter, would they would they look at your Instagram or DM you on Instagram or email you? Well, well, they just email, but uh, um, nothing's set for next year yet, but uh, um, it will be. We have a website, boatbasin.org. You'll see what was going on this year in terms of pricing and stuff like that. It'll probably change for next year. There's a chance this area, and I think a good chance this area is going to lift off and uh, Heswitz Peninsula Trail will be involved and Heswitz and stuff like that. So we'll see what happens, but um, I think the future, the Clackwood tourism is going to be Hesford Harbor. It's just a phenomenal place to visit. The foreshore hiking is, is par excellence. Everything works. And so, but nobody comes there. It's sort of uh, isolated, which is good because nothing's being developed there. And uh, so when it gets developed, it can be done in style. And I think it's all going to be educational recreation. And uh, we'll see what happens. But it's a pretty, pretty special place and um, easy to get to relatively. Well, did you have a question? No. Are there any other questions in the room? Oh, we've got one at the back. Okay, thank you very much for the awesome presentation. Uh, the question was about indigenous versus invasive plant species. So you had spoken about how you had removed a lot of the indigenous uh, plant species and moved more towards some um, non-indigenous plant species. Are you getting any pressure to get rid of some of those non-indigenous plants? Or, uh, well, no, no, I think that's the interpretation is wrong. The reason why I saved the non-indigenous plants is that they, the only way they would have got there is if Cougarani had planted them. So you're trying to save those plants. So you wipe out the stuff that's marched back in from the forest and uh, that's all over the place. So you're not really wiping anything out. I mean, it's just everywhere. Uh, the salal, the broom and, well, not the broom she introduced, but the, uh, and they probably introduced broom. Actually, you saw some of the great colors of broom she introduced, um, probably from Scotland. And probably early settlers everywhere in BC planted that because it's in the pea family. It, nitrogen, it fixes nitrogen. But who knows? Uh, but um, nevertheless, no, the idea was to try to leave as much of her plantings in there. Well, it was pretty obvious that if it wasn't indigenous, it was her planting. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much. That answers your question. We, uh, Catherine has put in the chat. Thank you for the wonderful, present, fabulous presentation. She's never seen anything like it and she would love to organize a group to come visit. And okay. Robin's coming up. All right, well, let's- uh, Come up this side, Robin. Yeah. The, the, speak towards the computer. Okay, this evening, um, uh, some Tussie Mussies are being awarded. You aware of Tussie Mussies? Uh, no. 
a posy. A posy, a little bouquet. And oh, I, can he see me? Uh, yes, yeah, I can sort of see you. Uh, can you see the posy? There. Oh, Rosie and the posy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tussy mussy, apparently. Anyhow, so we award it to you. In well, that's fine. In absentia. Okay. <laughs> some lucky late some lucky lady will take it home. Okay. That's <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Is that from your garden? Uh, no, a, a, no, a friend's garden. Oh, okay. Yeah, she do, does a beautiful job with bouquets. Oh yeah, no, it, that is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter, for a wonderful presentation. Okay. I, will, I will be getting in contact you with email about posting it. And then uh, uh, we can post a link to your website there too, so that uh, people can have access to uh, find out more about traveling to your wonderful spot. Yeah, great. And, and again, if you like the show, I mean, maybe pass on the opportunity for others to see it. I mean, if there's a fairly large group with, with the potential, there might be some visitors coming out of it. That's what we need, and any help you guys can give would be much appreciated. I, I really enjoyed this opportunity. I didn't choke too badly, so <laughs> I mean, it's always difficult the first time. No, you handle it very well, Peter. That was You're right. giving a big round of applause. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Hopefully, we'll see you there. Okay, I hope so. Thank you. I'm going to hit this button called leave. Here we go. Okay, bye. Adios. <laughs> All right. Um, so Val is just telling people the website is boatbasin.org. Yeah. And we'll put it up on the YouTube channel with a copy of this presentation and a link to the website. And Val, do you want to do a short uh, five minute break before we go on with the rest of the meeting? Okay, so we're going to take a short five minute break while we go on with the rest of the meeting. Okay. If everyone wants to hang tight on the actual meeting. Thanks so much. Sounds like everyone's having a great time. Thank you. Okay, you'll, you'll want to come around this side when you actually go to speak. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just, I was just going to talk, talk to her. So, Sonia? Yes, I, hi, Val. Okay, Sonia? Yeah? Um, if you could add Robin to the agenda. Okay. And, and we're also putting, um, as per Bonnie's uh, request, we're putting membership and book sale before right. treasurer. And where does Robin fit in the reports? Uh, where, did, where did Robin go? Robin goes um, probably at the end. Okay. After, after sort of reports. Okay. Okay. It's great. Okay. It was good, eh? Okay. And of course, I did my usual trick of printing off the agenda, leaving it in the printer at home. <laughs> Oh God, that's okay. I have written it out. <laughs> so, are you going? Are you going to share the agenda? Um, I well, okay, I'm not uh, able to find it. But I, no, I, 
I probably can't do that. Don't worry, Victoria will do it. Oh, okay. Great. Thank God for Victoria, that's all I can say. Victoria, you are amazing. You're so patient. <laughs> 